This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the ASUS Rogue Strix SCAR GL703GE. Are there enough words in that name, right? Well, what's exciting about this is Intel 8th generation coffee-like 6-core CPU inside. One of the first to actually sport that. So, certainly there's going to be a performance improvement there. We saw this with the Ultrabook CPUs when they went from 2 to 4 cores. Thought more cores is good. Free beer is good. More cores, I'll always say yes. Beyond that, you still got, this is the affordable model. So you have that lower end GTX 1050 Ti NVIDIA graphics inside. So it's a decent entry level gaming experience, but it's a lot of power for 1249. We're going to look at it now. All right, so first off, what is this laptop? For those of you who are new to it, I, you know, there have been several generations of it, but let's talk about how this place is. This is a 17.3 inch gaming laptop, although you can use it for pro apps and anything you want, obviously not just gaming. Relatively speaking, it's in the category of reasonably thin and light, not razor blade, crazy, super thin and light and expensive also, but fairly thin and light. Com compare this to something like one of the big body Asus Rogues or an MSI Titan or something like that. It's going to look downright slim. It's kind of a normal looking laptop in that respect, so it looks good. Uh, also, with the strict scar edition, it's growing up in looks where it used to look kind of plasticky and cheesy, which isn't unusual for gaming laptops, even ones that aren't that cheap. It's got now it's got a really nice looking uh, aluminum lid on it. Scratches a little bit if you're not careful. It's gunmetal. It's a little more mature looking. The inside has a carbon fiber finish to it, so it's getting a little more classy looking and a little bit better put together. Less creaks, more solid design. So all of those are good things. This is the more affordable model of, of the GL703GE with Intel HN CPUs. Specifically, this is the ES73 model. Now, there are other variants, too, that have better appointments. If you want a GTX 1060 or a 1070, such things are possible also in this model. But we're looking at the 1249 model, which is a lot more consumer friendly. You're looking for something with some good power and SSD inside, all those sort of good things, RGB backlit keyboard, but you don't want to be spending $2,000. Well, this is, that's who it's for here. This is good enough to play most AAA titles, current titles, Far Cry 5, for example, you're going to see on screen Mass Effect the Andromeda, not because it was the best game, but hey, it was a pretty, it is a pretty demanding game. And it can play those solidly on medium settings at 1080p, and that's with 60 frames per second, which which a lot of us like for gaming. Now this has a really nice display on it. It's 120 hertz, so it's a fast refresh display, and it's also wide color gamut, 90% of Adobe RGB. So that's a little bit better than average in this price range. You don't always see that. Now, those of you who are into gaming laptops know when you hear about fast refresh, well, then you know it's probably a TN panel, not IPS, and that's the case. That said, it has very good viewing angles for a TN panel. When I saw it, I could tell because you, you get that off angle shifting of colors and all that sort of thing, but it's really not bad at all. It's pretty well done. I think it would be tolerable for most people. Now, here's the thing, and you can even get a panel with 144 hertz refresh rate in this, in this series. Now, if you're going for a GTX 1050 Ti, you're not going to be driving games up to that frame rate. The idea is you want it, the refresh of the display to match the, the frame rate of the game and how it's playing. Not so much going to happen with a GTX 1050 Ti, even with six cores. I don't care if you've got eight CPU cores. It's just not going to happen unless you're playing older games. So Battlefield 1, no way. Battlefield 4, yes, it's a possibility. So in a way, it's a little bit of a marketing thing there, in the, the refresh speed on this display. One thing is nice, though, it does have good response times being a fast refresh TN panel, so you're not going to see a lot of ghosting in first-person shooter games, that sort of thing. So when I say this is relatively thin and light, it's 6.72 pounds, which for a 17-inch gaming laptop is not that heavy. That's 3.04 kilograms. As you can see, it's fairly slim looking. It's not chunky at all. Now, what's going to take the hit here is going to be your battery life because a lot of laptop manufacturers are doing this for gaming laptops. When they're reducing the weight and the thickness, it's because they're cutting back on the battery. So you have a 64-watt-hour battery inside. That's not really big. There are even some Ultrabooks in the 13 to 14-inch size that sometimes have batteries of that capacity. So that tells you, even though we have NVIDIA Optimus here and you can use Intel integrated graphics, it switches automatically, in fact, you're not going to have super duper run times here in terms of battery life. You know, gaming laptops are usually not so great, but this one manages about five hours on average doing productivity kind of stuff and streaming video, not playing games. It'd be 
two hours or less if you're going to be playing games on this. So it's okay for battery life. It comes with a standard 150 watt charger, which is adequate to keep the thing charged while you're gaming. It's not going to drop power or anything like that. So inside, the good stuff. Again, for one of the first Intel Coffee Lake 8th generation H series CPUs. Those are the 45 watt CPUs, not the Ultrabook U series CPUs that came out first. So these are the ones in mobile workstations and gaming laptops that have more oomph. And what that means, usually higher sustained turbo clock boosts. So it's going to perform better. And in fact, it does. So this is a Core i7, a six core CPU instead of the outgoing generations, four cores. And unsurprisingly, we do see a performance improvement. And this is exciting because with gaming laptops the past couple of generations, CPU performance really hasn't changed very much with each generation. It's really been up to NVIDIA, to, and they have been doing a good job to improve their graphics performance. So this time, yes, it's good stuff. Now, for you gamers out there, what does that mean? Uh, well, yeah, and you can see some benchmarks on screen here that will help you figure that out here in some the frame rates and, and the, the settings that we're using on these games tell you that it's not going to change things so much for most games especially things like first person shooters that tend to be really more hard on the gpu now open world games open world maps and ones with either lots of players and multiplayer or lots of npcs generated those can hit the cpu more and that's where you you'll see a bit more improvement if you're playing rts games like civ yeah i did notice that the turns are quicker and that's pretty nice so when when it comes to gaming, nah, it's okay, but it's not going to change your world. But for those of you who use this for more than gaming, if you're compiling software, particularly large programs, you'll notice faster compile times. Uh, if you're encoding video and exporting it, that's usually a CPU dependent activity largely. And you can see the handbrake comparison right here on screen right now between the old Core i7-7700HQ and this new Core i7-6 core, we see a 26.5% improvement in encoding times as reduction in encoding times. That's pretty good. Now I started with a one gig file, then it was about two and a half minutes on, then I started testing with some other files that were even longer in duration and the same held true. So about 26% performance improvement for your export times for video is not cheap Cheetos. That's a very nice thing. Also there are CAD programs, there are other programs out there that are CPU heavy and that's where it is going to make a difference for you. Our model has 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM, and that's fast, 2,666 2, megahertz RAM. Now, our unit came from Computer Upgrade King, CuckUSA.com. They've been providing a lot of our review units lately, and they'll customize this for you if you want. You'll see about taking it apart later on. It's not the most fun laptop to take apart and upgrade. There are two RAM slots. One is hidden, one is populated, unfortunately. The hidden one is the one that is the empty slot, so it's a little bit of a pain if you want to upgrade your RAM. Anyway, two RAM slots you can go up to 32 gigs of RAM max. This has both an M.2 SSD bay, and for the price, it's nice, PCIe NVMe. It's a Kingston 128 gig drive. This is not going to win any speed race against the best Samsung SSDs out there, but for the price, it's fair, and it's nice that you got a boot SSD at all. Anyway, they can upgrade that for you, too, and there's a one terabyte 5400 RPM hard drive in there, again, upgradable, obviously. So, usual upgradable stuff inside for your internals and the usual configuration of that. Something that's neat is this is one of the first ones we've seen using the new Intel AC9560 Wi-Fi card, which supports supposed gigabit Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 5.0. Performance was perfectly fine for us. It has an RGB backlit keyboard, and it's a very nice keyboard with nice key damping, nice travel. If you're just going to use this actual for really typing, it's a nice experience. Of course, you 17-inch laptop, you have a number pad as well, and you have a ASUS Precision Trackpad, which is meh. A lot of gaming laptops do have meh trackpads. It is better than MSI, I'll, I'll give you that. It's okay. It's not my favorite. You'll probably use a mouse if you're gaming anyway. It looks pretty cool, though. They've got neat little like measuring lines on the trackpad, and they've spiffed it up visually anyway. So how about heat? Does six core, cores make things worse? No, not really. Just like with the quad-core ultrabooks that we've been looking at with the U-series CPUs, in part it helps because you have a lower base clock speed, just like with those ultrabook CPUs. So the base clock speed on this is actually lower than the Intel 7th gen that it replaces, but the turbo boost goes even higher. 
Anyway, the thermals on this and the cooling design is pretty good. Pretty two large fans inside of here. It's well managed. And Asus is using 12 volt, volt fans instead of five volt fans. And they say this allows the fans to spin more quickly. Whatever the magic sauce is that they're doing here, it runs fairly cool. I Even when gaming, and you can see on screen the metric of temperature there when playing Mass Effect the Andromeda for about half an hour. Uh, the core temperature is typically around 81 degrees centigrade, well short of the 100 degree thermal maximum there. That's good stuff. And as usual, the, the NVIDIA GPU is relatively speaking just fine, no more than 74 centigrade. So that's good. It's a gaming laptop. When you're gaming, you will hear the fans. They're not screechy, they're not annoying, but they're, they have plenty of volume, certainly. In this price range, you're not going to get Thunderbolt 3, but you do get USB-C Gen 1. You also get a collection of USB-A ports, your traditional USB-A 3.1 ports and three of those, and one USB 2.0 port. Why they did that, I don't know. Headphone jack, your SD card slot, the normal stuff going on here with the ports. It has both an HDMI ports, HDMI 1.4 though, not 2.0, and a display port, mini display port. So it makes it easier to plug in multiple monitors and if you need faster refresh rates and higher resolutions, the display port's the one you would choose for that sort of thing. Getting back to that display for a minute, it's a very nice looking display. I know a lot of you like this panel. You can see the panel model on screen right now and the full metrics for the display. 90% of Adobe RGB is a charming thing to have in a gaming laptop. I like that. So for those of you who are using pro apps, you're doing photo and video editing where you would like more color gamut, particularly if you're working for print, that's a good thing. The color calibration, not very good. Too cool by default and the color accuracy, you can see on screen there, it wasn't really good. But with calibration, you can bring it in line sufficient that I would have faith in this for using it for, say, editing my photos and that sort of thing. So it's a pretty good panel, honestly, and the brightness on it is decent for a gaming laptop. All in all, though, I really like that color. It's very rich looking. And the contrast, TN panels have come a long way. They used to be very weak for black levels. Blacks look more like light gray. Now blacks look black, so the contrast level is also just as good as an IPS display. It's good times there. All right, so far I've liked most everything about this laptop, except when it comes to opening it up and taking it apart. Usually gaming laptops are fairly easy to open and upgrade. Gaming people are enthusiasts, they want to upgrade their stuff. Well, Asus just continues at the forefront of passive aggressive annoying design when it comes to these sorts of things. So first off, the case screws on the bottom here, there are three different sizes of screws. So I have to keep track of those Phillips head screws. The longest ones are at the back, then we have really short ones at a corner, in the front corner, and then we have the medium ones. So okay, you might say, you know, I don't have to take the whole bottom off to upgrade stuff because Asus has this little access door here. So you might look at it and say, well, that looks like a removable door. You have to remove the rubber foot first here to get to the screw that retains this. That's a little bit icky. Okay, so here we go. Not unusual. Sometimes we see with laptop makers, they make the most likely to be upgraded stuff available to you. Here's your hard drive bay with the hard drive in it. Here's your M.2 SSD. This is one of the two RAM slots. So I've, this is not the only laptop where there are two RAM slots, but only one is readily accessible. But unfortunately, they've decided to put the RAM in the easily accessible slot and leave open the one that's harder to get to. Okay, so now there's four more Phillips head screws that you have to unscrew from here before you can peel off the cover that's retained by clips. So you do all of that, and then you discover, you know what, the hard drive is actually connected to the bottom cover. How annoying is that? So there's this little data cable right here that you lift up. It's got a little pull thing right there. So you have to pull that up to pull that off of the motherboard. That connects right over here. This is altogether complicated, isn't it? It could be worse. It could be an Alienware. I know, but still. So. Here's our RAM. This is a heat sink that they've put on here. It's gooey. You can just lift that right up here. That's a 16 gig module on our particular one. Again, nice fast DDR4, 26, 66 megahertz. Here's your other RAM slot, the one that wasn't readily available in case you wish to upgrade your RAM later on. Obviously that would mean a maximum of 32 gigs, 16 gig modules are the largest that you can get right now. So now that you've got the cover off, you have access to your fans if you want to clean them, your heat sink, if you want to repaste or anything like that. So you can see the screws here. It's a, it looks like a tripod kind of heat sink design here. And there's more screws right there. So if you're trying to figure out where they all are, so it looks like we've got a trio of screws for here, trio of screws for here. So for the CPU and for the GPU. Good size fans here. Nice number, pipes, three pipes, which is fair enough for this kind of level of GPU and performance going on. And obviously the little battery over here. 
No heat sink on the chip over here. That's interesting enough, but it runs very nice and cool. So I have no complaints about that. Here is our Wi-Fi card. Again, the latest generation Intel Wi-Fi card, which is pretty darn cool. And these are our fairly ample sized stereo speakers that do in fact sound pretty decent. So there it is, the latest Asus Rogue Strix SCAR edition here with a nice metal kind of lid going on. But like I said, the most exciting thing about this is the Intel eighth generation hexa-core CPU. So you got six cores inside now. And yes, certainly it does make a performance difference. When it comes to gaming, as you saw, not a huge difference. But for those of you who are using this for other things, pro apps kind of work. If you're doing video exporting, for example, I'll say yes to a 26% performance improvement from one generation to the next, wouldn't you? Compiling software, that sort of thing. Anything, any CAD program that you're using that actually is more CPU dependent rather than GPU for calculations, it's going to be a big, uh. And in general, for this laptop, it's a good entry-level gaming system, which is what a GTX 1050 Ti is still considered an entry-level one. Not quite up there for VR, but I don't think that matters so much. But you can play any of today's most demanding games at medium at 1080p at 60 frames per second. That's not bad. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.